Hi, welcome to this week's Authors Love Readers podcast, where we delve into the stories behind the stories. We're asking authors questions, some of them fun, some of them serious. And from their answers, you're going to learn things you never knew about the people who write the stories you love. My name is Patricia McGlynn. I'm your host and designated question asker. I'm Lou Aronica, and I'm an author who loves readers. Now, let's start the show. Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of Authors Love Readers Podcast. This is going to be so much fun. I have Lou Aronica here this week, and Lou and I know each other. The the listeners are going to be shocked by this. You could probably all repeat it with me. We know each other from Novelist Inc. (laughs) One of the reasons I'm looking forward to this so much is because Lou and I know each other very much on a business standpoint. That tends to be what we talk about when we see each other, the industry broadly or specifically what's going on with us. So this is an opportunity to talk about your writing, and I'm really excited about this. So tell us, first of all, Lou, all your hats, and then tell us about what you write. (laughs) Okay. Well, among the hats that I wear uh, is publisher of the story plant, which is the independent publishing house that I started uh, t- almost 10 years ago now wow. uh, after uh, after a very long stint in uh, in mainstream uh, corporate publishing. Uh, so that's mm-hmm. one thing. I also wear the editor hat on occasion when I find a project that I feel like taking on that doesn't uh, that doesn't fit the, the story plant list. And then there's the the whole writer thing. Which um, actually, there are two hats there too, because I, I write fiction, of course, but um, but I also write um, a fair amount of of nonfiction, always in collaboration with somebody else, because my personal story is not particularly interesting and nobody <laughs> would pay for it. But uh, but I do um, I I do love working with people whose stories fascinate me. Um, I've written, um, I've collaborated on two books on education. Ah. I've uh, just recently finished an amazing self improvement book with a guy who will just blows my mind. Uh, and uh, and actually, I'm I'm veering for the first time in my in my career into uh, into something close to inspirational, which will be fascinating to see how that plays out. That yeah. So the right so the writing thing really sort of manifests in in two ways. My First love is fiction, and I adore writing fiction. There's a d- decent amount of uh, of income to be made on the uh, on the nonfiction side, and and I happen to really like the partnership piece of it. Mm-hmm. So uh, so I, I I do enjoy writing nonfiction as well. I have so many follow up questions from that, um, and so I'm going to take them backwards. Do you find that it is less solitary writing the nonfiction? I, I do just well for actually for a couple of reasons actually that's an interesting question I, I, both because it you know it keeps me in regular contact with at least one other person mm-hmm. as as that's going on and and that I you know I, I do you know writing is such a solitary thing that uh, that it's it's nice to be able to just sort of reach out to somebody or text somebody and and sort of collaborate in right in the moment um, and the other thing is that you know with with nonfiction, I sort of have to reach out into the world a whole lot more. So I'm interviewing people, and or I'm I'm doing a tremendous amount of research and that sort of thing. And so it does get me active in a way that um, that fiction doesn't, because fiction is is so much about you know about tapping into oneself. Yes, and and solitary might not have actually been the best word because I think it's it's not just whether you're with people or you're not with people. But I find fiction it's very much in my head. Absolutely. I'm living in my head. Yep. <laughs> and so I and having the background in journalism, you don't do it that way. You are more out there in the world. And I was wondering if nonfiction was that way too. Uh, yeah, no, it very much it very much is. Um, you know, especially yeah, I, I have. Uh, I have written memoir on occasion, and that is very much like writing fiction. It's it's like mm. writing fiction, except it's true. But 
when you're writing just about any other kind of nonfiction book, you know, it's important to have sources and it's important to, you know, to verify what you're, what, what you're saying and, and that sort of thing, or, or to find a point that underscores the thing that, that you're trying to say, or to find somebody out there who can speak with authority about the point that you're trying to make. And so, you, you know, you are sort of always reaching out, you know, I mean, I, I, I have, you know, nine tabs open, you know, when I'm writing a, a nonfiction <laughs> book, you know, because I'm constantly, you know, shuttling between one and, and the other two, uh, to, to see how, uh, how those, how the points, you know, play off of each other. And how, another follow-up question is how did this come about? Did the, did the business side pull you into writing or did the <laughs> desire to write pull you to the business side? You know, here's the deal. I was, I was supposed to be a teacher. That was, that was the, the, the Teaching idea. what? English. I was going to okay. be an English teacher. I, you know, I, I, I graduated college with a degree in, in English and one does one of two things with an English degree. One becomes a teacher and the plan was for me to be a, a teacher because I both loved it and because it meant that I could write during the summer because because I, I knew you know from uh, from back then my minor was in creative writing um, that I wanted to to write um, but the other thing that you do with a um, with an English degree is going to book publishing <laughs> um, and so <laughs> when I graduated there were just no teaching jobs uh, there were just none available at all um, either that hmm. or they were just saying that to be nice to me when they were turning down but <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, he's gone. Now we got a job. <laughs> but any, but I, you know, so so I went into book publishing. And I thought, yeah, well, that's that's cool. You know, I'll, I'll you know I'll spend some time in book publishing, and you know, I want to write books. So you know, uh, you know, I'll I'll just learn more about the business, and then I'll be better equipped when I go out there and and become a writer. And I just totally fell in love with the book business. So hmm. for twenty years, uh, I completely set aside any writing at all. I mean, any writing at all other than, you know, like memos <laughs> and things like that. White papers. I, I, you know, my, my long form was white papers back then. <laughs> but it, it really just, you know, it, it got to the point where, you know, I was, I was feeling more and more that desire to, to do it again. And then, you know, through tremendous good fortune, um, I was publisher of Avon Books and uh, well, that wasn't the good. Oh, that was also good fortune. But the the tremendous good fortune was that um, Avon was acquired by News Corp. And when News Corp bought Avon, they looked at my position and they looked at my salary and they said, "Yeah, we could probably do without this." You know, it doesn't matter that <laughs> that the company has had more bestsellers in than ever in its history, or that its its profits are better than it's ever been before. You know, we we've got to synergize. We already have a pu a publisher. So at that point, I certainly could have gone out and tried to find another gig in, in the business. Um, but I thought, you know, this is the message, you know, that the message is it's time for you to, to, to start dedicating yourself to writing. And that's, that's really when I did it. You know, it would be an interesting study. How many people became more serious about their writing, became full-time writers, you know, wh whatever measure you want to use because they were booted out of one kind of nest or another. Yep. Well, it is very hard to, and I'm not the kind of person, yeah, you know, I was already, you know, I was already getting, you know, up at, you know, a quarter to six to commute into the city. And, you know, I was already coming home at, you know, seven thirty, eight o'clock at night. So the idea that I was going to, to carve out more hours to write was just a non-starter. And yeah, I had kids and I, you know, it's, yeah. it just wasn't, it just wasn't going to work that way. I wasn't going to do it on the weekend or any of that sort of thing. So, you know, it was, it was really easy for me to say, yeah, some other time I'll, I'll do that some other time. And, and, and really that was the, that was the conversation that my wife and I had when, when the, uh, the Avon thing happened was, you know, if I don't do it now, <laughs> you know, if I, if I just go and get another job, then yeah. you know, it's just never going to happen. And so, so that's really why I just decided to do it then. Well, the other element, or a couple, there are a couple of other elements, because I, 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 as you know, I worked um, part-time at the Washington mm -hmm. Post for a long time after I'd begun publishing. I'd worked there 
full-time initially. And then I got, was writing full-time and working full-time, got really tired <laughs> <laughs> calling coworkers by character yeah. names. And, you know, I'd get in my car and I, I, no matter where I meant to go, I'd end up at the post. Right. So <laughs> that this is not sustainable. <laughs> and, and one of the things that, that I found, and, and not only, yeah, I haven't asked one question. I'm always already asking another one. But I want you to apply this too to what you're do, dealing with now. Because I found mm -hmm. um, writing takes a lot of emotional energy. And I can push myself to do other things and finish other projects um, at the end of the day when I'm right, tired. Right. But I am not doing my best writing at that point. So you have that carving out emotional energy versus needing a lot of intellectual mm -hmm. energy for the business and the editing side that you do. Um, and so how do you balance those? How do you deal with them? And and do you have any wonderful tricks <laughs> on how to switch immediately from it's for me, it's easy to go from the writing to the business. It's really hard to go from the business to the writing. You know, that is and that actually is the challenge. The you know, for me, what you know what I learned, which was uh, was incredibly liberating, was that you know I was I was good for at most three hours of writing a day. Oh. You know if if I if I did more than that, I produced what I produced in three hours. You know and and so you know I, I could I could revise all day. You know if 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 I was at that stage in mm -hmm. in a manuscript, mm -hmm. I could yeah I, I could do that because as you know you know re revising is a very different, but it can't create. Right. For more than three hours a day. So what I found was that it was very easy for me to stop myself after that time and move on to other things. Uh. But I do agree with you that the, the big challenge, the way I structure my day is I deal with sort of email and, and you know, triage and that sort of thing the first, uh, the first couple of hours of the day. Then I, then I focus on writing and then the entire second half of the day is, is focused on publishing. And it does definitely, there, there are definitely situations where there's something in the email that really needs to be addressed or something comes up through some email message or something like that. And, and yeah, you know, I, I can't stop thinking about it. And ah. those days tend to be wildly unproductive on the creative side. And, and, you know, what I've learned to do is just accept that that's the case. And, and sometimes just don't write at all that day. Yeah, I know some writers who say that they won't look at email and that stuff before they start writing. And I, I'm weird uh, anyhow because I tend to be more of a night person. Mm -hmm. I'm a winder during the day rather mm -hmm. than an unwinder. But the idea of having that email sitting there. Oh, <laughs> I know. Not knowing I know. what's in it. <laughs> I know. But yeah, but I do, yeah, because I work with so many writers, you know, uh, on the publishing side, I, I just can't completely, I can't ignore it until, you know, one thirty in the afternoon, you know, so I, I have to look at it first thing. Bless you <laughs> from the, from the writer's well, standpoint. Well, because as you well know, a lot of writers are night owls. And so uh -huh. I get a lot of, I get a lot of communication after I go to bed, which, and I go to bed pretty late. <laughs> um, you know, but, but so by the time I'm down in the office again, which is around, around six, um, I often have in the morning. Yeah. Well, I, I kept my oh commuting my hours. Gosh. You know, that was actually, that was the big challenge, the big challenge. And th this is the thing that I've heard from a number of people is, you know, transitioning from having a, a full-time corporate gig to working for yourself. People often find it hard to, to motivate themselves. And what I just decided was the easiest way to do that was to keep the exact same hours. And if I did that, then I was imposing a certain amount of structure. And if I imposed that structure mentally, then I could just turn the the you know the 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 entrepreneurial thing into a, you know into a you know into a full time gig where I wasn't I wasn't mm -hmm. really thinking well I could always go and do this or something like that. I, you know I was I was focused on on that. So yes, I I do get to to my desk. Uh, latest actually at six. <laughs> often, often it was it was about four thirty this oh, morning. I was up until past <laughs> well, there you go. So, <laughs> so, so you would be sending me an email and I would be responding to it. Um, oh, yep. But it, yeah, but it, so there is a fair amount of that communication that happens overnight. You know, so I feel like if I don't respond yeah. to it, 
until the afternoon that I'm being irresponsible. So I really have no choice but to look at it. Yeah, but authors like you wouldn't <laughs> know if you didn't respond to time. Okay, good point. <laughs> the early point. afternoon, anyhow. <laughs> um, you know, the other thing, and I bet I, I bet you would do this too. I tend to work more. Oh, no question now. about it. I do work more than when I worked full time. Um, so it's it's not so much being tempted to oh I'll go do this. It's Yes, I'll get one yes. more thing and done. you know what I don't know it, it, because I, I actually it, it, amazingly I've never discussed this with any of my um, of my friends who are still on the on the the uh, big five publishing side. But yeah, you know, I I don't know how much of this is just the ubiquity of communication now as opposed to when I was last in an office. But um, hmm. but yeah, I do, I find myself. I mean, I you know just before. Yeah, just before uh, putting Colbert on to, to end the <laughs> to, to end the night, I'll I'll, uh, I'll check my email one more time. So you know, so I am sort of in communication, you know, for a good eighteen, nineteen hours a day. Do you ever take breaks from it? Do you ever like go off on trips and just yes. not have? Yes, absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. And do you do you get the shakes or do you love it? Uh, I mostly love it. It, it. it you know, it's so dependent on where I left things. You know, I, I never yes. have an issue on the writing side because I I just I, I I can begin and end writing fairly comfortably. It's on the business side, you know. It, it's especially with the publishing company. It's just hard to let it go for any length of time, or to let. I mean, and I don't ever completely let it go. I think you know, my my wife and I mm-hmm. recently celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary and and took thank you congratulations took four days off and i did not go on my business email once during that time yeah that was the one time (laughs) um and then actually we did we took a a trip to um to ethiopia because my my youngest daughter is is ethiopian and and we did not have the option of being online for a few days and and i was a little frantic about that (laughs) I was, I was I was a little frustrated by the fact that I I couldn't stay in touch and and felt a little uh, you know skittish about it. Well, I, I I totally understand the difference between making the choice yourself and having it imposed on you. Yep. And, yep. But the other the other factor is like as for authors who are indie, everything everything flows through you, and yes. so if you're not communicating to people, other people can't do their work. If, yep. if you're not passing it on. So yeah, that gets, um, if you can plan it ahead, um, it's a lot more work, but then things can continue to flow while you're out of pocket, but, um, it's tough. Yeah, yeah, it is. And it, and you know, the thing that, you know, because, you know, there are the way we run the story plant, you know, there, there are only a couple of people who are actually on staff and then everybody else's contract. And, yeah. you know, and those things happen when they happen you know issues come up when when they happen or and opportunities you know you know we're we're distributed on on the print side by national book network and opportunities come up and you know if you're not there to (laughs) to to find out about and and of course that's the thing that i'm thinking about when i'm not in communication (laughs) yeah what if a a, a co-op opportunity all these things are happening When when you said it was easy for you to pick up the writing, do you have tricks that you do? Do you do something to get your head back into the writing right away? Um, yeah, I, I tend to. I, I think this is a, a classic writer trick. I, I tend to you know reread the last section uh, with fiction, and this is my you know the, 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 you know there. I think there are two kinds of writers in the world: the the the, uh, the pantsers and the and the and the planners, and and I am. A, a dedicated planner. I, I storyboard uh, I everything. That. I storyboard everything. Uh. And so the storyboarding actually does, you know, make writing relatively easy to trans- transition back into because, you know, when I'm writing a novel, I, you know, I, I just, I'm, I just go to the storyboard and it's like, oh yeah, right now I'm writing, I'm writing the scene now. I'm, I'm maybe I do really short term storyboarding. <laughs> Because what I tend to do is if I'm wrapping up a session, uh, you'll have 
at least I have a lot of things mm-hmm. in my head about, oh, yeah, I could do this and I could do that. And it's not what I'm immediately writing, but I have all these um, thoughts. And so I just type them with dot, dot, ah, dots. That makes between. total sense. And that's usually what I do at the end. And then when I pick up the next time, I'm filling those mm. in. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm moving them around to where they belong. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of sorting them and dealing with them and filling them out. And that gets me back, gets my head back to where it was when I left off yeah. the previous well, that, session. That totally works. That totally works. Uh, and, I, you know, it's interesting you said that because I'll actually find on the nonfiction side, what I will often do, you know, I'll, I'll often get to the point where I'm sort of, I, I can't go any further that day, but I'm in the middle of, of something. Uh, and so I'll do a version yeah. of what you're talking about. I'll just leave myself, you know, a handful of, of you know, of, of statements, you know, and 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 that will walk right. me right back into it um, when I get get going the next yeah. day. Tell the listeners about what kind of fiction you write. It's all character driven, relationship driven fiction. Um, I you know the the thing that fa- the thing that fascinates me about uh, about writing is the ability to sort of put one's soul on the page. And mm-hmm. the thing that I'm most interested maybe even the requirement well indeed I think I think that is true and I think that's not always the case but I think it is it is true that it, it's required but what I'm most interested about in the world is the way people connect with each other and so mm-hmm. it really is the only kind of fiction I'm interested in writing I, and it manifests in a couple of ways I mean I, you know I, I've I've written I've written a couple of fantasy novels but they're um, but they're relationship-driven fantasy novels, um, and they're mm-hmm, and they're mm-hmm. not, um, and they're no dragons or mages or anything like that. Um, and and I've written some love stories, and and the, and then I've written some, you know, straight up friendship, parenting, you know, uh, father, son, father, daughter uh, fiction. Um, it, it it for me, you know what how people are connecting and how they're changing is, is the thing that, you know, that gets me going. Um, it's what I love to read and it's, and it's what I, I love to write. So all of, all of my novels, all of my, all of my novels, and I have, a, I have a thing about this. I, I believe that every writer writes about one thing, um, even if they write many different kinds of, of, of books. Um, uh, and my one, my one thing is, is relationships. When uh, I have a question that a, a reader asks that I would like to a- apply now. Well, eventually we're going to get back to what was supposed <laughs> okay. to come at the beginning. <laughs> That's what editing is for. <laughs> this is the way I write, too. <laughs> um, and the reader asks that when we finish a book, do we miss the characters and do we think about them? And I, I love what's implicit in this question that this reader does think mm-hmm. about and miss the characters. And, and I'm thinking. I'm particularly interested in your answer because you're dealing with different manifestations mm-hmm. of relationships. So do you find some characters stick with you more? Do all of them? How do- uh, yes. And, you know, interestingly, it's almost never the viewpoint character. Um, you oh. know, it, and yeah, I, I mean, I write. I, I almost always write in third person, so there are often multiple viewpoint characters. But there's there's often a main protagonist. There should be, mm-hmm. um, and that's not usually the one. Yeah, but often the object of the relationship becomes uh, becomes an obsession for me. I, I think the the biggest the the biggest iteration of that for me was in my novel Blue, which is also my favorite of my novels. It's a it's a fantasy novel about a, a father and and his estranged daughter and and what happens when the uh the the bedtime story world that they created when she was younger comes to life um and mm. and it's all part of of very dramatic happenings for her and um and i found myself you know dragging my heels at the end of that book, <laughs> that, that, that book because i didn't want her to go away you know i didn't want i didn't uh-huh. want her to uh to not be there anymore um not be there as in i couldn't you know write more of her um and yeah i do i do think some of that that you know you know i i i don't most of my fiction is not is not autobiographical although i i what i 
I often say about that is that you know it's an it's emotionally autobiographical. You know, I've I've, I've felt all these feelings, um, but but not um, that the story itself is not autobiographical. And but the way Blue started is not anything that actually wound up on the page. But Blue started because my first child was going away to college, and I was totally freaked out about that. And, and so, and I knew that, you know, writing a novel about a father freaked out about his daughter going to college was not going to appeal to very many people. <laughs> so everything about that story changed. I don't know. I think they have a built-in <laughs> audience there. <laughs> um, but I think that was part of it was that, you know, I was, you know, you know, by, by saying goodbye to Blue, I was, I was fully acknowledging that, that, that my daughter was going away. So are you ever tempted or have you ever then written a second story about one of the characters in that original the only time i've ever done it, i've done it in two novellas i did write a novella prequel to blue called until again um, which told a, that title. a thank you uh told a, a a key story that it, that didn't fit the narrative of the novel um so so this it told it was an important component of the story but it was not it was not central it, it would it would have stopped the narrative if I had uh -huh. written it in blue. So I did that. And then the only other time I've ever done it, um, uh, I, for my novel, When You Went Away, I wrote a novella. I wrote a Christmas novella a couple of years later, going back to the uh, the same characters called A Winter Discovery. Um, but that was, that's the only time I've ever done it. Uh, you know, I've always been sort of reluctant to write, you know, ongoing series or anything like that, because I sort of feel like novels are supposed to say what they have to say um at the same time it's interesting you asked the question because i've been i've been dying to get back to blue uh to write another story in that world but i it, you know to me and I, I think because i'm so emotionally attached to that that novel it's got to be as important to me as blue was and mm. i just haven't mm. found a story that is so um i, I won't i won't do it just because i want to use the characters again See, I, I love <laughs> revisiting the characters and, and coming mm. back to them. And it's particularly interesting. I, I've always done, well, I haven't always done it, but I've done it a lot in romance. And now I'm doing an ongoing mystery series, which is first mm. person. And yeah. so I'm really attached to this character. And I'm working on book seven now. And I'm thinking that there will be at wow. least 12 to 15 books. Really? Yeah. Wow. Um, and, and there's an overall character arc for the, for the series. But each mm -hmm. book has uh, resolves the mystery, the murder mystery, um, and I love <laughs> kind of sliding back into to Elizabeth's world and um, oh sure, and being with her buddies and all that. So I I really love that. Um, yeah, I totally get it as a reader. Um, you know, I mean, I there are many uh, you know continuing series that I read. Uh, for for pleasure and and you know I certainly get it as an editor I'm I'm I have several series on the on the story plant list I just for whatever reason it just it just doesn't work for me as a writer well that's very interesting and I wonder if some of it is because you have less time to write so you <laughs> Could be. Know, so you want to you want to to deal with the distinct stories i when when you were talking about not doing it what i was thinking is what would push me to not continue with characters are the other characters who pile up in my head right and are right. going hey hey you know yep. tell my story get busy you know what are you doing yep. you're spending all that time with her and that's the hard part yeah i would i would think probably the hard part for mental health too <laughs> But so do you find that you do have characters pile up like that? I do. Yeah. I, I it's, it, um, you know, it, it's interesting. I think it's less, it's less characters than stories. Um, oh. my, my character thing is a whole, I've got this whole process. I, it takes me six months to start a novel because I do this whole storyboarding thing. Then I do this whole character thing where I'll, it could take a couple of months just for, to, to, to make the characters real to me. And, and so that tends to come after I have the story. It's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I, I prioritize characters. Char characters are the most important thing to me, and yet they come last. Um, and it's funny because I, you know, I, I, I'm a, a songwriter also. I, I call myself a songwriter. I don't think anybody <laughs> else would call me that. But, but, the, um, but, but I, I prioritize the lyrics, but the lyrics come second. 
And, you know, if I don't, if I don't have a good melody, I can't, I can't write the lyrics. And, and so, you know, the, the things that are bouncing around in my head are, you know, are, are the stories or, you know, are ideas or, or messages that I want to get across or, or whatever. Um, the characters don't really show up in my head until I'm actually writing it. I mean, and not, I'm, I'm actually not writing it, until I'm actually committing to writing it. Well, I, I, although I work in completely opposite way, I, I can recognize that. I, I have done a workshop with Emily Richards that we call writing from the inside out or the outside mm -hmm. in. Some of what you're talking about and what she does, it seems to me the working from the outside in, the outside being the story, the, the structure, possibly the theme, and working into the hearts and souls mm -hmm. of the characters. And, and I tend to start with a character or two characters yakking <laughs> at each other, usually in conflict, and I have to work my way from there out. But you have to have both. And, and in a lot of ways, it doesn't right. matter where you start as long right, as you exactly. get to both. Yeah. I but now that brings up another question from a reader. Well, we're doing this totally <laughs> out of order, Lou. <laughs> um, and, and who wants to know where our story mm. ideas come from. And what I particularly like is this reader says, our beautiful story <laughs> ideas. And she says that she knows of, a, a, of an author who dreams her stories or another one where, like me, where the characters mm. start yakking at me uh, or are yakking at each other and I'm just eavesdropping. But so how did your whole process start? Where did that first inkling that this might be a story come from? It usually comes from something I want to say. I think that's, you know, for, for me, you know, fiction is, is a way for me to to expound, you know, and I, I, God, please don't anybody think that, <laughs> that these are preachy books. But uh, but but, you know, it, it, when I when I choose to write a novel, it's because I, I want to say something in the novel. And so it usually comes from the thing I want to say and then a novel evolves out of that. When I wrote my novel, the, the Forever Year, which was actually the first novel I ever finished, I wanted to write uh, about my father. Uh, I wanted to write about um, fathers and sons. And and so then I started thinking about my relationship. My, he, he had recently passed and, 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 I, and I want, and you know, I wanted to, you know, obviously one thinks a lot about that at that time. And, and I wanted to sort of capture it, but then the novel has none of him in it. <laughs> it's, I mean, he's, I mean, it's, it's definitely a father, a father son mm. story, but it's a completely different father son story. But, but it, it was mm -hmm. all driven by that idea of, you know, writing about, you know, about fathers and sons. Um, you know, when, when I wrote, a, uh, when I wrote my novel, when you went away, I really wanted to write a novel about fatherhood, um, about being a father as opposed to having a father. Um, and there are other mm -hmm. themes that mm -hmm. I write about with the fathers, but the the story that emerged out of that, you know, so I, so I thought, okay, I have some things that I want to say about being a father now, because being a father now is different than being a father, you know, was 30 years ago. To, and the story that came out of that was about a guy who'd, who who was suddenly thrust into having being the sole parent for an infant because his wife had oh. suddenly died and his his teenage daughter had disappeared on her own uh, by choice not not through abduction or anything like that mm. um and so it was him and this baby and that was that 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 I, I, ne I never would have come up with the idea. Hey, let's. I'm going to write a book about a, a guy taking care of a baby. <laughs> it, it came because I wanted to say certain things about fatherhood, and I needed to isolate it. You know, I needed to. I needed there not to be a mother mm -hmm. on the scene. I needed there not to be any other family. Mm -hmm. I needed to be so isolated that I could, I could tell that story. And then, of course, it builds out because it's a novel, and you have to have much more than just that. But, but that's where the ideas come from. They tend to come for me um, out of the message that I'm trying to get across first, and then the story evolves. Do you ever end up having told a story that you like, and it does what that story needs to do, and yet you 
have not resolved the initial thing that you wanted to write about? Huh. Huh. Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, I mean those I mean there are there are definitely a couple of books. I'm not gonna name which, but there are a couple of books that I am less <laughs> happy about than others. Um and that tends to be because of that, you know, where I wanted to I thought I had a grand statement to make, you know, and, and it just didn't happen. <laughs> You know, or or I just didn't have the chops. You know, it, for whatever reason, it you know I I couldn't get the 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 big statement on the page. Well, and to be clear, the the story that you that you wrote, the book that's out there, can be totally satisfying to the reader, but it wouldn't. What I'm getting at is that maybe it had not satisfied the drive that started you on that path. Yep. And you, yep. you took a little different path with it. It was a great path. It was the right path for that book. But you still have that initiating um, yep. story in you, gnawing at you. Right, right. And I sort of feel like I wasted it. You know, I actually do, no. I do have a couple of... Well, yeah, it, it's not that, it, that, not that I wasted it in that I, I wrote a, a, a book that was a waste, but that I can't... I feel like I can't go back and do it again. <laughs> At least oh. that's been, you know, and and I think that's, you know, mm -hmm. it, that goes around to the time thing again, you know, I mean, uh, well, you know, yes. I, you know it, it'll be, you know, I will hopefully have a novel out in the spring and that will be three years since my last novel. Uh. So, you know, the novels don't come that fast. And so I don't feel like, all right, well, let me try this again. <laughs> that kind of thing. That, <laughs> that That's not an available option. So, yeah, I sort of, you know, when I, when I miss, I sort of feel like, okay, well, that, that, that shot's gone. Ah, oh, that's too bad. Well, <laughs> yeah. You'll, you'll have more, more time. Well, I, at some point, at, at some, some point, point <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and, and now I'm finally going to cycle back around to some of the fun, lighter questions okay. to let readers get to know you sure. and, and starting with something really light and fun. Do you have any deep, dark fears <laughs> 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 and do you use them in books? Huh. Um, I'm, I'm, I no, I don't use them in books. That's interesting because I do. I'm certainly have, I mean, I am insanely superstitious. I mean, ridiculously huh. superstitious. I mean, there are all these, these, you know, the I, things that, I, you know, you know, I've got to make sure I walk out the door a certain way. And that's starting to sound a little OCD and that's not the case, but. I was going to ask if it was from family. Uh, no, you know, I just think, I actually think if you really want to know, I think it's from being a sports fan because, you know, I know that if I'm sitting on the couch a certain way that the Yankees are going to win. <laughs> and That's the one area I'm superstitious to. <laughs> so, so I think it just has pervaded my life. Um, no, I think, you know, I mean, the, the biggest, my probably my biggest fear is of drowning. You know, it just mm. for whatever reason, it just it, the the idea of, and I I don't swim well, and and so you know, being in water is always is a tense thing for me. So, but it, it, that has never shown up once in in anything I've written. So no, I guess not. I, I mean, yes, I have d deep fears, and and no, they don't show up in my books. Now I'm expecting it in the next book. <laughs> <laughs> Can you look back on your childhood and can you pinpoint a book or some books that, that you went, whoa, okay, this is story and this is what I want to deal with in my life? Yep. No question about it. They, uh, I can point to, a, we were, my, my parents and I were going on a, a long drive and we stopped at a store and my, my mother said to me, yeah, why don't you pick out a book? And I picked up um, Ray Bradbury's I Sing the Body Electric. And it just, I just disappeared for the entire length of, of time. How old were you? Do you know? I was probably 11. <sighs> um, and that was the first time I, you know, I, I, I enjoyed reading prior to that, but that was the first time that a book just took me away. Mm. And, and that transporting experience was, was, uh, was very influential on me. I, I you know, I, I, I knew that. You know, it, it, at that point, I it sort of determined. You know, that was one of the deciding factors that I, that I really wanted to write, and um, and that I wanted to write stuff that took people away. That's wonderful. That's that's terrific, and that you had that. But yeah, Ray, and it was, and, and and just as a as a coda to that, um, one of the great moments in in my professional life was when I got to uh, work with Ray because oh. he is an amazing. He was an amazing, amazing 
man. Uh, as as wonderful as he seems on the page, he's more wonderful. He's oh, more wonderful in that's, person. that's so wonderful to hear because you often. You know, oh, I know. Not I know. often. So often not the case. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but no, we worked together for fifteen years, and it was it was amazing. Oh wow, fifteen years! Yeah, yeah. yeah. To, to have to have a true hero, you know, to be be able to work with a, a true hero is uh, is a real privilege. Now, I, and another one of these podcasts, I was telling somebody about um, as a brand new um, sports writer right out of college, and he had already retired. So I'm not quite that old, but I met <laughs> Ernie Banks, mm. and I can remember calling my mother like in the hotel lobby saying, <laughs> I met Ernie Banks and he said, I'm a lovely young woman. <laughs> That's great. That's One great. of the highlights I oh, think, absolutely. Of, my, of my life, but I didn't get to work with them for 15 years. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it and, was, I mean, I, I still, I mean, whenever anybody asks me about, you know, what it's like to work with writers, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is working with Ray. Well, that's tough on the follow-up writers. You bet. You bet. <laughs> and and I let them know it, by the way. <laughs> You're no Ray Bradbury. <laughs> so, but when you were, well, this is, this is particularly interesting since you were also an editor. As, as you're coming up before you're maybe actually writing fiction, did you used to mentally, or as an editor, did you actually rewrite endings? To stories. Oh yeah, all the time. Oh, 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 I mean, as as a uh, a consumer of stories, I would rewrite okay. endings all the time. I have a huge issue with endings, and, and it's become sort of an epidemic issue at this point because I'm, <laughs> I'm constantly complaining at the end of a movie or something like that about the ending. Um, because I think there's so few people who do endings really, really well. And by the way, I don't consider myself to be one of those people. Um, but um, but yeah, I, I, I would, I was constantly rewriting stuff. Interestingly, that did not apply. And it still to this day doesn't apply to my editorial experience. Um, you know, I, I learned, I, I was taught the business by, uh, by Ian and Betty Ballantyne, who, uh, Ian, Ian founded mm -hmm. Bantam Books. Yeah. Um, and then Ballantyne Books. Yeah. Ian actually brought the paperback book to the United States. Um, but, um, but Betty, was the was was the, you know just taught me that you know it's the author's book you know <laughs> and and you don't get to say you never get to say I would do it this way um and so you know it it, it has never really been my thing now obviously if if an author says to me I'm really having trouble with the ending I'll I'll try to make some suggestions but you know on the editorial side I've I've always felt very strongly that yeah my job is to be first reader it's not it's not to be second writer oh that's a good way to say it yep and there is there's something magical in that first read because you and um i've been an editor more on the journalism side mm -hmm. but um as a writer you can never ever read it the way a reader will Right. Because right. you know what you were trying to get across. So you can't really tell whether you did yep. or not. You can tell when you didn't right. <laughs> a lot of right. times, but you can't necessarily tell when you did. So that, that editor read is really vital. Yeah. Um, now, beyond the book business, have you held any um, odd or interesting jobs? <laughs> uh, well, the, the most ridiculous job I ever held, and I held it for, for two weeks, was... Um, it's going to date me, but I was I uh, I had a job in high school counting linotype. Oh my god! Yeah, gosh. there were um, for for all of you out there who are are, are younger than I am. What uh, you know uh, before before computers, uh, newspapers and and uh, magazines were actually printed by little slugs of type that were set into a board and then and then run to the printer. And there was, there was this, it was, it was horrible. There was this linotype company that in, uh, in uh, Suffolk County on Long Island, where I, I grew up that, you know, they would hire kids to take inventory. And I oh. stood there for, I mean, you would just stand there for eight hours a day <sighs> counting these little pieces of metal. <laughs> Oh my gosh! <laughs> it's mind numbing, and no, you so know, these were the pieces of metal metal before they were imprinted with letters. Yes, they these, were this was the, the stock, the, right? The, the stock of of uh, of letters that they would then use to uh, 
to, to compose the pages. But boy, was that a staggeringly dull job, which was great, you know, because then you, every other job is better than that. <laughs> it looks good. <laughs> right. I will tell you my first um, newspaper job right out of school, it was still hot type. Mm. Um, and that was when they used So they would they'd write the stories. Then there were people down in the composing room who typed it mm. into these big, huge line to type machines. And then they would take those slugs and arrange them into the yeah. page a, 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 on something they called a turtle, which was a, a, a it had wheels and it had a form around to shape the page. Mm. And then that would go in and be printed. Well, I, it was maybe the first month I was there and they were getting ready in the process to go to computers and, and start doing that. But this was still hot type. And it, page one was the last one to mm. go out always. And it was the what released the, the edition. And one of the printers started to push the turtle. And instead of getting the part underneath it that supported it, he just got uh. the frame of the page. And you uh. could hear the metal <laughs> falling out on the cement floor. And it, it went dead oh, yeah. silent. I mean, everybody knew what that meant. And it was like half mm. of the front page. And one of the old grizzled composing room guys turned to me and said, remember that because you're going to be one of the last people to, yeah, to have yeah. seen it, you know, because it, 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 it was such a change. And, but it was so clear. Everybody else knew exactly <laughs> what it meant. It was changing of an era. So Yeah, indeed. An, an era that de desperately needed to change. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. We shouldn't get into that. I can <laughs> tell newspaper <laughs> stories. So, okay. What's your favorite taste? Favorite taste? Salty. Okay. Yeah, I'm a total salty guy. And how about your favorite color? Blue. No question about it. With an association, a reason? What? You know, I really don't. It is. It has always been blue. I mean, from okay. from the time I can, from as long as I can remember, I, blue has been my favorite color. Okay, as a writer, do you have a bad habit word or words or phrases? Um, you know what I have, and it, and it, it's not a, it's not specifically a word. Um, I have dialogue ticks. You know where I will have somebody nodding or chuckling uh -huh. or something like that in every freaking conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it. And I, I know as I'm doing it, I'm telling myself not to do it and I still do it. Um, and then, you know, I, I, sometimes I take it out and sometimes I don't, but I, but that's, that's my biggest, uh, you know, my biggest writing foible, I think is, is when I'm writing dialogue at some point in every conversation, somebody nods or, or somebody, you know, or somebody tilts their head to the side, you know, I mean, there, there are five things that I use and, and I use no <laughs> other things. Well, it's hard to use other things and those convey so much right, right. says, says she who never uses them. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about because you've talked about being a um, a songwriter mm -hmm. and um, enjoying that aspect of it. When you were younger, say in your teenage days, was there a, or, or earlier was there a particular song or music that really turned you on to that? Was there a song that you thought was sort of your anthem? A song, probably not. I'm trying to think. Uh, there, I mean, there were certainly a few. I could think of "Whiter Shade of Pale," for instance. But um, but I would say that I was enormously influenced by the Beatles. Um, the, the Beatles, I mean, you know, there's you know, the certain, you know, the way people talk about, you know, where they were when, when Kennedy was shot or, or something like when the, the Twin Towers came down or something like that. You know, I know exactly where I was when I saw the Beatles and I had Sullivan because, because my mm. life changed at that moment. You know, things were, things were not the same after that. Um, because I resonated with it in a way that just, you know, it, it, I still, you know, I'm still more moved by music than anything else. And when I heard the Beatles for the first time, um, it was, it was a life-changing event. 
And what about it? Because so many people, like when you talk about that the Beatles were on the Ed Sullivan show or the Beatles, people talk about it as a sort of cultural um, event, but you're talking about the music. Yes. So what specifically about the music? The, the, the combination of propulsion and melody, you know, which just oh. wasn't, you know, I, you know, I was, I was destined to be a, uh, you know, uh, to have music be a central part of my life because my, my sister is 13 years older than I am. And, and so, and so when I was born, rock and roll was just sort of becoming a thing. And, and there was music in the house all the time because teenagers play, you know, play mm-hmm. music in the house mm-hmm. all the time. And so I, I literally imprinted on, on music right out of, out of the womb. But all of that music, that all that music up till the Beatles was largely rhythm. You know, it was, it was largely, you know, the, the, the rock music that, that that was separating people from the popular music before that was largely about the sound of the guitar, the sound of the drums, that sort of thing. And what the the Beatles did that was so mind boggling was they had that, but the melodies were gorgeous. Even in the in the pure pop songs, you know, the stuff that you know we don't consider the great Beatles songs now. You know, I want to hold your hand or something like that. Those melodies are beautiful, and oh, yeah. and I think that's what just took me over. Even at you know I was I was five when <laughs> when the Beatles played Ed Sullivan but um but you know e- even at that age I could just feel that this was not like anything I'd heard before and that it was something that I I really really wanted to keep hearing so yeah I think it was it was that combination they were you know to me they were the first act that really um that really combined true rock and roll with classic melody, with you know the kind of melody that you know the, the great songwriters of the of the the forties and fifties used. Well, and I'm also I'm I'm thinking I'm significantly older siblings too, and it was more my brother who played the music. But as you were talking, I was thinking he tended to play either a little bit of the rock and roll, the heavy rhythm, mm-hmm. or um, folk music. Mm. And he probably tended more to the folk. And I was thinking about the melodies and and, and to some extent the play with words mm-hmm. in folk music and that, that some of that shows up in the Beatles too. And the, it does. And blending. It does. And I didn't know anything about that at the time because no. you know, well, my, you know, my sister, my parents, you know, my parents listened to, you know, Perry Como and, uh, you know, Dean Martin and people like that. And, and my, my sister was, you know, Elvis Presley and, and that sort of thing. And, and I didn't know anything about, you know, Woody Guthrie or, or, um, you know, you know, any of the, the, the great folk singers of the time, or even, you know, Peter, Paul and Mary or somebody like that. Um, that all came later. So for me, th- this was really the first time that I'd ever heard that kind of melody. Hmm. Hmm. So how about now? Do you have a song that means a lot to you now? Something you gravitate? Wow. Wow. A song. Yep. <laughs> you know what? Actually, I do. I do. I, be, because my, my favorite song of all time actually comes from that period, um, but has, has lasted all, all of these years, um, is God Only Knows by, by the Beach Boys. Oh. Um, Brian Wilson is is a is a real hero of mine. One I never got to work with, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, but God only knows what what I love about God only knows is not only is it a, 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 a just an unbelievable beautiful piece of music, but the the lyrics, the simplicity of the lyrics about you know what one person means to another person, it, it is so universal because it's mm. not just about you know about romance. romance. It's yeah. it's about you know, it's about loving deeply at any level. And, you know, in fact, it was the song that my my oldest daughter and I danced to during her bat mitzvah and then again at her wedding. And Aww. and and so, you know, so it certainly, you know, doesn't only mean uh, mean romance to me, but but that that song that that song in a lot of ways is it's the evocation of everything that I try to write. about. <laughs> so, yeah, it's definitely the the defining song for me. It's a very tender song without being sappy at all. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, and and also the you know it just how spare the lyrics are, you know, and how effective mm. they are at conveying so much with so little. Um, you know, that's that, that's something that every writer should aspire to. 
long as I was mean to you about one one song, I will give you three movies that you're going to take to my bizarre little desert <laughs> island that <laughs> okay. for some reason lets you play movies, but only three. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, okay. So three movies. Three movies. Um, well, Star Wars would have to be in there because okay. I, it, 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 I, I just – think it's the it's the gold standard for for science fiction film and 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 i love science fiction film so so there there's that um the graduate because it just you know speaks to that moment when everything is changing in in one's life so incredibly well and then hmm you know, one of my favorite movies, and it's harder to love it now than it <laughs> than it was when I when I for for the first thirty uh, something years that I did love it is Annie Hall. I mean, I just you know it's you know it just, I think it uh-huh. says so so much about relationships and about how complicated they are and how difficult they can be and that sort of thing. And of course, you know, it's a little harder to be a Woody Allen fan these days than than it used to be. But the movie, if uh, one can divorce the, uh, the 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 filmmaker from the film. Um, it still holds up. Now, those are really interesting. I can often see connections among the movies, although each of yours mm-hmm. is iconic for a point in time in particular, mm. and yet it still has things to say now. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure that there is a, a clear connection between these. Okay, Lou, I want to make sure we, that we get to some questions that some readers have asked. I've, I've slipped a few in, but there's one in particular Well, we might already know the answer to this, but we will ask you. This reader asked if there was any author that we could work with and write a book with, Mm. living or dead, who would it be and why? Mm. Well, you know I'm going to say Ray Bradbury. (laughs) Well, except I think we should disqualify him since you did get to work with him. Okay, we will disqualify. That's true. That's true. Okay, good point. A writer that I have not worked with. And somebody you want to write with as opposed to, to work with okay. as their editor. Fair point. Fair point. Um, well, a writer I would have loved to write with is Pat Conroy because oh. I just I, – I love how dynamic his relationships are. You know, they're, they're, they're outsized in a way that mine aren't. But every one of Pat Conroy's novels was – intensely about the, the the relationships that people had with with each other and and the the complications that come from caring too much you know and, and that sort of thing and and mm-hmm. you know I would have loved the opportunity to to work with somebody who uh, who had that skill and and also I mean who who wrote sentences like Pat Conroy sentences that's wonderful and and you're not the hmm. first one Hmm. to mention him. What surprises me is only one person so far has says Shakespeare. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I think, you know, I, I think because we, we really have no vision of, of Shakespeare. You know, I mean, we don't even know if Shakespeare was Shakespeare. <laughs> that's one of the reasons I would pick him. I would right. know the ah, answer. Good point. Good point. <laughs> okay. Another reader asks, what is your favorite place to write and why? And then ask, does it have an inspirational view? And I, I, I'm really touched by this because I think the the reader wants us to have an inspirational view. <laughs> you know, the reader is going to be disappointed because my my favorite place to write is in my office. I just, I actually find, you know, I when I first started writing, I would do things like go to the park or you know or sit outside or you know go to the beach or or that kind of thing. And I found everything else so distracting that I just couldn't write. Yeah. You know, I wanted to be in that. I didn't want to be writing. So really, mm-hmm. my favorite my favorite place to write is in my comfy chair on my, at my desk. You know, just typing away. I yeah, I think there's two two schools of thought about that about whether you want to. I I never understood people who can write in like coffee shops. Because no. I'm too busy eavesdropping. What are you know? What are <laughs> absolutely, you doing? absolutely. Although I will tell you that the most productive writing experience I ever had uh, was when I was writing um, my first novel. When I was writing the Forever Year, because my my middle daughter was a, a toddler at that point, and I just 
started working out of the house and she totally didn't get the idea of somebody who was in the house working. <laughs> you know, that if you, if you were in the house, then you were there to play. Yes. And, you know, and it, it wasn't working out. So I, I, I went to the, uh, the local library and, and I wrote that novel there. And what was fascinating about that was that it, I was so productive because the way I usually write is I write a sentence, stand up, walk around, Come sit down, write another sentence, stand up, walk around, make some coffee, you know, whatever. whatever. I'm, I'm constantly, you know, I'm, I'm constantly moving while I'm, while I'm writing. Mm. And you can't do that when you're in a public space, especially at a library. <laughs> Other people get annoyed. Well, you could, you could do it for a short time. You might. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then they ask you to leave. Yeah. But so I found my, you know, I found I had to sit there and write. And so I did. But it didn't stick. I mean, as soon as I as as soon as I was able to close the door, I didn't have a door at that point for uh, for my my where I was where I was writing. And uh, as soon as I could close the door, then it became uh, my office. Well, and the other question is the things that you wrote at the library when you had to sit there and write. Did they remain in the final book? They did. They did. I was okay. act- I was actually really really focused, and actually the only other time it ever happened was when I was writing a Winter Discovery, which was the novella uh, related to When You Went Away. We had, we had no power for for several days, and so I had no choice but to go to the library, and I wrote the entire novella in three days because I was just there, you know, doing that, and that is the novella. That's the that's the published book. I'm supposed to have a um, a writing date with Ann Christopher ah. um, coming up in a bit. And we're going to do it at the library, which is a really nice, really nice place. My concern is books. Yeah. <laughs> All those books <laughs> <laughs> sitting there waiting for me to take them off the shelf. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Very good point. Very good point. So I'll have to report how yeah, that works. Yeah, let me know. <laughs> Did your writing change a lot from when you first got published? Did that experience change how you write? Um, yeah, yeah, actually quite significantly because in, in a couple of ways. One, one was, was technically because there were things, you know, it was, it was such a funny experience for me because I had spent 20 plus years editing other people's writing before I mm. wrote a novel. And, and so, yeah, I, I thought I was pretty good at that and, and certainly thought I could apply it to my own work and, and learned that that was seriously not the case. But I also learned that I was, I was making some stupid writer mistakes that, you know, writing in passive voice and that sort of thing that, yeah, I shouldn't, I, I would, I would easily have caught if somebody else was doing it, but, but I, I didn't catch it in my own work. So Certainly, there were the, there was the technical side, but the piece that was actually the most significant. This was when I got my my editorial letter for the the forever year. There was a there's a, 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 a sibling relationship in there, and the editor said said to me, "I'm having a hard time understanding why he hates him so much." And I thought. Wow, that wasn't what I was planning. At all. I thought I was fairly accurately reflecting oh. a relationship here, and and it made me realize that there were some some issues I had to work out. But but it made me super conscious from there on of the the psychology that of of the experience of writing and and the and the stuff that you're working out on the page um. you know that that all of us as writers tend to work stuff out on the page and and after that i became especially conscious of of the the psychology behind the the relationships and and how i was reflecting them and and if i was um if i needed to to do some work Outside of the page, <laughs> before I could, I could, I could get the, get the thing right on the page. Well, I I will say that sometimes, it, at least I'm conscious of what I'm doing. I I had a mystery book not too long ago in which I killed off a number of employees of a an enterprise called Visage Tome, mm. <laughs> and mm. I knew exactly what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> It was great therapy. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so 
do your books change a lot on you from when you first? Well, I guess you have said this. They do. They have changed on you from your conception to to oh, when yeah. you get. Oh publication. yeah. Publication. Yeah. Yeah. Even I think, though you've planned them out. Yes, because what what happens is, and, and I think this is this is the thing that that people who don't storyboard don't understand about people who do storyboard, it, which is that a storyboard isn't a straitjacket. It doesn't lock you in to to you know, putting the words down in exactly this order or anything like that. What it it does is gives you a, a great template and it allows you to, to sort of play out all of the the ramifications of the story before you start writing it. But what I've found in every one is that as the characters come alive, as the story begins to to evolve, that uh, the 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 tone of the story changes, the um the spirit of the story changes, sometimes the story changes. I mean there have been there have been times where something looked great in a storyboard and when I got there, it was like, eh, that's not going to work at all anymore. It's just, you know, not, you know, not the way the story is supposed to go. And then I'll re-storyboard. I don't actually just keep writing. I don't know that I've ever written a novel straight through and it came out exactly the way I thought it was going to come out. Okay, Lou. So now we have come to my very favorite part, which is the rapid fire, either ors. You have to okay. make a choice. Okay. Appetizer or dessert? Appetizer. Binge watching or make the watching last as long as possible? Binge watching. Dinner out or cooking at home? Dinner out. And Oh, okay. I was going to say, and you have to cook, but you just got rid of that one. Well, no, because I, I love cooking and I cook every every night. So Oh, dinner okay. So dinner out really means it. Yes. Yep. Paper plates or best china? China. Opera or show tunes? Well, I have to choose? Yes. <laughs> yes. This uh, is either or. Opera? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Day a rock and night. roll guy. <laughs> oh, that's true. Okay. Day or night? Uh, Day. House decorating or gardening? House decorating. Paint or wallpaper? Paint. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> who stripped a lot of wallpaper. Pickup or sports car? Sports car. Ice cream or cake? Ice cream. Spring or fall? Spring. Hiking boots or cowboy boots? Hiking boots. Daisies or roses? Roses. And is that forgetting or giving or both? Uh, definitely forgiving um, and actually definitely forgetting. Okay. Cruise or trekking vacation? Oh, trekking, definitely. Hot air balloon or train trip? Train trip. Cat or dog? Oh, dog, no question about it. <laughs> Coffee or tea? Coffee. Winter Olympics or Summer Olympics? Summer. And you notice I presuppose that you like one of them. <laughs> <laughs> nail polish or bare nails on uh, presumably on other well no bare not necessarily you could have nope. okay nope. um and this is the last one grab the best first or save the best for last oh i'm totally a save the best for last guy. <laughs> well this has been wonderful lou thank you so much i've had a great time it's thank been you. so fun to learn more about your writer side because as i said we usually do connect on the business yes, yes. element so that that it's been a delight really appreciate your taking this time with us oh, thank you and for the listeners hope you come back next week for another edition of authors love reader podcast where you will meet another author and learn about the stories behind their stories and in the meantime i wish you a week of wonderful reading That's the show for this week. Hope you enjoyed it. And thank you for joining Authors Love Readers podcast. Remember, you can always find out more about our guest authors in the show notes. And you can find out more about me at www.patriciamclin.com. You can also send in questions to be asked of future authors at podcast at authorslovereaders.com. Until next week. Wishing you lots of happy reading. Bye. If you like this podcast, we hope you'll consider becoming a supporter through our Patreon page. With a small monthly donation as little as a dollar a month, you can help with the hosting and editing costs that make the show possible. To thank our Patreon supporters, we offer them special bonuses. Find out more at authorslovereaders.com or at patreon.com slash authorslovereaders. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.
We also hope you'll subscribe to this podcast and leave us a review wherever you listen to us. Both of those help more folks find the podcast. Of course, the very best way for other folks to find the podcast is for you to tell them about it. So we sure hope you will.